So welcome. This is Andrew Hartman, and uh, he does absolutely fascinating things that are of great interest to me. And uh, I'm uh, going to get clear on the terms of what he calls himself, because I uh, have, have gotten in trouble uh, with the, the sensitivity of the topic and the, and the misunderstanding of what he does is uh, quite possibly as important as what he does. So, so, so explaining it. So, so what is the title that you would call yourself uh, f from this particular part of the work that you do with, uh, with women? Okay, well, thanks for having me, Derek. Yeah. And so I'm a surrogate partner. Okay. And a surrogate partner is someone who forms a temporary relationship with someone with a client under the supervision of a therapist to allow that client to have a real life environment to develop relationship skills. Mm -hmm. and, and anything in a relationship can be included. Um, and what, um, what Derek's referring to is that previously he referred to me as a sex surrogate. And, a sex surrogate, right. Yeah, and I want to say that I really, really dislike that term because it's very misleading. Uh -huh. uh, imagine you had a professional chef who could make a whole bunch of appetizers and entrees, but also spent about 10% of his time making pastries. Yeah. It would be really misleading to call that guy a pastry chef, right? <laughs> okay. Right? Gotcha. Because if pastry is in the title, that makes you think that that's his focus or yeah. that's what he does exclusively. Okay. Whereas if pastries are a very minor part of his work, mm -hmm. maybe he just includes them because if it's part of the overall experience of a meal. And so that's okay. why it, it would be misleading to call me a sex surrogate in the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because okay. sex is not the focus and sex is only included if it's relevant to the client's goals. Okay. Because it is an aspect of relationship. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm in agreement that sex is uh, a uh, significantly small part of the overall experience of connecting and being vulnerable and, and being open and, and relearning intimacy. Um, se sex may or may not be a part of that. Um, so, so, so you have a client. Now, when we talk about your clients in this type of work that you do, we're, we're, we're obviously talking about women. Right, we're talking about. Well, I work with women. Okay. There are other surrogate partners of different genders or orientations that work with different, you know, that work with various genders or, um, or preferences in their okay. clients. Okay. Um, but I do happen to work with women. Okay. Um, I have had one male client, but that was someone who needed help more in a coaching capacity rather than in a relationship. Um, generally, I form a relationship directly with the client. Okay. And so that's why I'm called a surrogate partner. Okay. And this whole process is overseen by a therapist. So there are always three of us that are involved, right? And okay. the therapist means that there's someone outside of the intimacy that we're forming. Gotcha. Right. Now gotcha. with this male client, there were specific reasons why he wanted to work with a straight male surrogate. And it was, but for someone who wants a male client who wants to explore eroticism or relationship building, I would refer them to one of my colleagues um, who is more likely to be able to, you know, respond to him in the context of eroticism and relationship building with, with a man. Okay. Okay. So it's fair to say that you're dealing with heterosexual women. Yes. That's a fair statement. Okay. Yes, that is correct. Uh, and, and feel free to jump in any time if I get terms uh, uh, that are uh, n not just wrong, but you know, kind of kind of misleading. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mis misguiding people. So, so I I work with lots of people. I work with couples. I work with men. I work with women. And how does a how does a woman go from uh, recognizing that her relationships have been, uh, you know, less than adequate, uh, 
uh, not fulfilling, even even abusive on the on the end of the scale, for years and years, and those patterns have been happening. Uh, uh, because I would say it's it's a unbelievably huge number of people I've worked with for a couple decades, where it's not like they've had a year of frustrating relationships. They've had many, many, many years. So, so how does a woman come to understand, you know, intimacy has been a problem at this level in my life and I want to work with a therapist and a surrogate partner to, to learn how to make bonds that, that I've quite possibly never experienced before. How does she figure that out and, and find, her, find her way to you? Like what happens for her to recognize that? Because surrogate partner therapy as a practice isn't that well known mm -hmm. throughout the country. Mm -hmm. sometimes, it's, sometimes they're referred by their therapist that they're working with. Other times they might see some portrayal of surrogate partner therapy in the media. Okay. And... And sometimes they say, oh, well, this could help me. Okay. Um, but it's, it's ideal for clients, like you said, who haven't had the type of connections that they want to have in their life. And they get to a point where there's a large amount of frustration and neither the life, the own, their own life experiences mm -hmm. or verbal therapy alone is helping them get there. And this is very common in the case of people who have past abuse and trauma mm -hmm. um, or other, other reasons why kind of a, a way of relating that doesn't work very well gets ingrained. Okay. And now whenever you're dating and whenever you're kind of meeting someone on the street for a relationship, each of those people have their own agendas, have their own needs, their own insecurities. Okay. And sometimes as people are getting to know each other, the insecurities of each other trigger, um, the, the insecurities trigger each other in a way that results in neither of them getting their needs met. Yeah. And what we try to do with surrogate partner therapy is to eliminate some of that uncertainty by having one of the people in the relationship be as unreactive as possible. Yeah, that would be you, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can just focus on giving that person an opportunity to see, right? Because if you have two people, you know, there's a question of in any relationship, what is me? What is the other person? And what is the relationship between the two of us, the interaction between the two. Yeah. So it's almost like there's three entities here and we're not sure if it's me or if it's the other person. And so in surrogate partner therapy, we try to create an environment where the issues of the client can be seen and addressed. Okay. Okay. Now, I work in the details of uh, communication and vulnerability with, uh, especially with the women in my women's group, for example. I obviously do it in person with couples, but women in the group send me literally their text messages from men, you know, when they're dating. And I do interpretation of what's happening and I show them and explain, you know, you know, this isn't okay. You know, th th this is a red flag, but here's why. Here's why you want to notice what this man is saying shows that he's uh, inconsistent or unreliable or, or, or so, some, some idea I have. And I'm quite good at it. I'm quite accurate at it. Now, I'm going to completely make up for a moment uh, uh, what you might do uh, in working with your clients. And then I want, and then I want to go from there. I want, I want to see how off I am. So, so, or on I am with this. So if, if you're out, I don't know if you call it a, did you call it a date? Like the first meeting, is it a date or is it a meeting? Um, the first meeting is typically what we call a three-way meeting. 
where That's the three of you, the okay. surrogate therapist and the client all meet together. Okay. And we do that to establish that we'll all be working as a team. Okay. And to get a really good sense of what the goals are. Okay. Now let me, I want to come back to that, but let me, let me fast forward to when you're actually with this person one-on-one. -on -one. When, when you're out, let's say, you know, you're out, you're having a meal. Okay. Um, do you actually do things like, you know, make a nice comment about um, how they look and then watch their reaction and then notice if, for example, they brush it off and don't let it in. And then do you move into talking about that? Like, you know, I, you know, I paid you a compliment and you know, that's a really nice thing for men to do. Like, like I, I truly have absolutely no idea how you would bounce between a real relationship you're creating where you're just going to be kind and, and, and teach them the world is better than what they've experienced so far in life or, or moving into interpretation with them to show them what's happening as something new and different and better than what they've experienced before so they can get like a new neural pathway going to, you know, to be on the path of healing. Am I talking about this in any kind of way that you, in the way you think about it? Not really. <laughs> Great. Okay. Let me take a step back. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Let's start Do there. You know? What the heck do you do? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. So basically, I believe that the most important thing that I do is help people overcome social conditioning and social, uh, societal conditioning and socialization with respect to sex, gender, and relationships. Okay. And I believe the, so it's one thing for, you know, as you said, I am a partner. I'm, I'm actually having a relationship with this client. Okay. But we want to structure this relationship in such a way that the skills that are developed are generalizable. Okay. Okay. Now, there's different levels of generalizability. Yeah. And the first level is if someone has an ex so if a female client has an experience of being in a relationship where she's treated with respect, then that in itself is a good thing because hopefully once she has a feeling of what it's like to be treated with respect, she won't treat, she won't uh, tolerate being treated any other way. Okay. Now, the next level of generalizability is to get a sense of what I do to help her feel that way, huh. right? So um, I might have a client say to me, well, I'm able to open up with you because I feel safe. Okay. And so that's the level one. Okay, I'm glad you feel safe. Now, what created that safety? Mm -hmm. So do you have a sense of what I do to help you create that safety? You, because, you really have her, you really check in with her and let her find her own answers. You right. Really little, put, little nudges to help her find those answers, okay. And ultimately, the, the greatest level of generalizability is if that client then has a strong enough sense of herself and what, what she wants and be comfortable asking for that, that even if the other person doesn't show up for her, then she still knows that it's okay for her to ask for that. Okay. Right? She's not going to make herself wrong for making the request, for having those standards, for knowing what she wants because this particular partner didn't honor those, that request. Okay. Now, in the time that I've worked with female clients, I've started to believe that almost every, I don't, I, I'm tempted to say every woman has had boundary crossings. Yeah. You know, but of course yeah. we don't say absolutes. So I'll play it safe and say almost every, um, woman out there has had experiences of boundary crossings, violations, having their boundaries not respected. There's also very strong socialization for 
women to have their attention on what other people want from them, other people's agendas, and not on what they want. Okay. And what they like. Okay. And so both of these together, you know, past experiences where boundaries weren't experienced, were, weren't respected. Yeah. And uh, socialization and societal pressure um, combine to create the situation where, where many women have their attention on what other people want from them and not from their own internal impulses. And there's a very important part of the therapy mm -hmm. where a female client can get so in touch with what she wants and what she likes that she's willing, she's able to start to lead with her own desire. <laughs> and this can never happen as long as she's responding to my agenda. Okay. Okay. And so I think the most important part of what I do is to not have my own agenda with respect to the relationship, but be there to help her realize her goals, whatever they are. Okay. You, you, okay. So, so as a man, I know the incredibly delicate nature of my words charming a woman and bringing her very quickly, very deeply into my heart and uh, uh, increasing the possibility of her falling in love very quickly. That's a, that's a choice as a man that I am unbelievably respectful of and cautious of and careful about. You, you, the power you have in doing this process with a woman in saying the things that will help her open up, it, it, it's the goal and she must fall in love with you. This most likely happens, right? Like deeply, deeply bonded in love with you. Has that, has that occurred? That has occurred. Okay. So it seems to me we're talking about two different things. Several. Yeah. Right. Yeah, One yeah. of those things is attachment. Yeah. You know, both on behalf of the client and yeah. behalf of on the surrogate. Yeah. And then the other is um, the way the surrogate can behave in a way to elicit a response. Yeah. Client. Let's talk about attachment first because, and actually, maybe if I could come back to that for a minute. Yeah. Um, I want to, I think we need to at least take a step back okay. again with respect to the therapy and kind of give you a sense of what it looks like okay. on a day to day practice. Okay. And in order to introduce this, I want to give an example that happened early in my practice. Okay. I had a client who came to see me for our first meeting. And we had talked by phone and by email before, and I thought we had a pretty good connection. Mm -hmm. So when she arrived, I asked her if she wanted to share a hug. Okay. She said yes. Mm -hmm. And so we hugged, and I continued on the rest of the session, and I thought that everything was okay. But whenever I called her later to see about scheduling another appointment, mm -hmm. she said, oh, I'm not coming back. Yeah. I didn't feel safe there. And... At first I was puzzled, but fortunately she was willing to let me know what happened. Okay. Whenever I asked her if she wanted to share a hug, she didn't want to, and yet she didn't feel comfortable saying no. Understandable, for sure. And I didn't pick up on it. Yeah, very subtle. And so she did something she didn't want to do, and then she didn't feel safe, and I didn't even notice. No. And so this really informed the way that I work now, yeah. I've started to see that the most important thing that I need to do right at the beginning is to establish that the client knows what she wants, what she doesn't want, and is able to communicate that clearly and is able to have boundaries against what she doesn't want and able to say yes to what she does want. Mm -hmm. And I started to call this the ABCs of surrogate partner therapy, ABCs being awareness, boundaries, and communication. Ah, okay. And now, um, because as I said, many women are not accustomed 
to considering what it is that they want and what they like, but then are responding to other people's agendas. Yeah. So this is what we need to establish at first. And I have a whole bunch of exercises that I will do with the client in order to establish that. Okay. Okay. We Lots, also do tons of attunement. I mean, you guys get into very specific attunement with the types of questions and answers you give each other. Well, actually, I don't want to particularly get into that much attunement. Okay. Right? Because if, if I'm that attuned to the client where I can kind of sense where she is, yeah. then that takes away the responsibility for her to communicate that. Okay, I get, I get it. So, so what happens when you do ask if she would like a hug? How... How much sensitivity are you showing her in your eyes to let her know you want the real answer? Are you oh. not even going into all that? Well, yeah, I am, but in a different way. Tell so me how. Okay. Imagine, so imagine an exercise. It's called May I Will You, where we make requests of each other. Okay. One person says, may I hug you? And the other person gives an answer. And then the first person says, thank you. And then we switch the roles. Okay. So... Um, and I like to do this in four phases. And the first phase is every answer is no. Oh, very good. You, you, you're taking the guess what the attunement I'm talking about includes guesswork. And uh, you, you're actually turning this more into very specific exercises to teach yeses and nos. Yes. Uh, and so the it. first exercise teaches nos okay. because then I can ask the client, so how does it feel to say no? <laughs> How does it feel to hear no? Because a lot of people who are, I call them people pleasers, they are uncomfortable saying no because they're afraid of hurting other people's feelings. Oh, I have no idea what you mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> but not only that, but they only will make requests if it's really, really important. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and in that case, guilty. Making a request and hearing no can be devastating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we want to practice saying no and hearing no in a low stakes environment. <laughs> okay. And so then the second phase is we answer yes to all requests, but we're not actually going to do it. Then we get oh, a very nice. Okay. Of then, what? then what? Then what? Um, then we on. get an experience of saying yes. Okay. Now, Often in this, like, I'm so excited about this exercise. Yeah. There's so much learning. It's incredible. That comes into it. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, it always happens that the client will answer yes to something that she would normally not want to say yes to. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then I ask her, so what do you notice? What happens for you right now? What do you notice emotionally? Do you have any physical sensations in your body? Like, do you notice a tightening in your chest or tingling in your palms or whatever? Because mm -hmm. this information is telling you in the future when your words are incongruent with your actual desires. Okay. Right? Because so many people pleasers are, um, have never really put their attention on what they want so um, they're not accustomed to doing that. Okay. And I've even had people, so then in the third phase, we check in with ourselves and answer, answer honestly. Okay. And some people say, well, I don't even know how to do that. I don't, I don't know how to know what I want. Yeah. And so at the same time we're doing these communication exercises, we're also doing simple touching exercises. Okay. Have you ever heard of Sensate Focus? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but but tell me more. Okay, so sensate focus yeah. is a simple touching exercise. Mm -hmm. It might be say from fingertips to wrist. Okay. So I'll say with the client, okay, we're gonna touch each other from fingertips to wrist. Okay. At first, I'm gonna be the toucher and you'll be the touchy. Okay. And then we'll switch roles later on. Mm -hmm. And we'll do this for three minutes each person. Okay. And then after that, we'll share about our experience. Uh -huh. And this is a way of getting in touch with body sensations yeah. and getting in touch with what we like mm -hmm. and what we don't like. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And so at the same time, we're doing communication exercises to explore what we like. Mm -hmm. We're also starting to incorporate touch. Okay. Because that's another aspect of, of relationship. Okay. And it starts out very gradual. And we go through a series of stages where we build upon one another. But we really need to establish the foundation first. Okay. What, um, what happens when you then get back together with the therapist and it's the three of you? What, what is the, like maybe one or two of the primary things that happen in there? Do, 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 do the clients talk about what they're learning and guide you how to get more in touch with how to work with them? Like what really happens in there? How do you, uh, are you more on track in a certain way after those meetings? Generally, the only time that all three of us meet together is at the very beginning of oh. the three-way meeting. After that, the client meets with me, and then they meet separately with the therapist, Okay. generally alternating between the two of us. And then I talk with the therapist between every session by phone. Okay. Now, there, during those calls, I let the therapist know what happened in the experiential work with the client. Okay. Because I often learn things about the client uh, with the stuff that comes up in our direct interaction that, okay. that other people don't learn um, just in a, verbal, in a verbal relationship. Yeah, yeah, okay. I also ask for the therapist's advice on what kind of experiential exercises are going to move the client towards her goals. Okay. And so that's typically the way that it proceeds. Now, there's a number of important reasons for the therapist. The one is that some clients aren't comfortable telling their friends and family that they're getting this kind of help. Mm -hmm. They might have shame or embarrassment about that. And so in that case, the therapist becomes their primary form of support. Okay. Also, the therapist is outside of the intimacy that we're forming. Yeah. Right? The therapist is objective. And there are some times when, you know, someone who needs this kind of help has um, habitual ways that they've been, do been doing relationship that don't work or that aren't effective. Okay. And for example, she might be uncomfortable being honest with someone else, or she might not be able to hear someone else without getting defensive. Okay. And so... Okay. If I'm in that direct relationship, then even though I'm a great communicator, I might not be able to make a client or a point to the client because of her habitual ways of relating to men in my role, right? Okay. To men who she's forming a relationship with. On the other hand, the therapist is outside of that and is objective. And sometimes the, the client is able to hear things and see things when they come from that perspective more than they can when they come from me. Sure. Right. Sure. Also, I had um, wow. one client who said, you know, I'm not sure how to relate to you. And you know, she said this to me. Yeah. She said, if, I, if I see you as a therapist, yeah. then I would tell you everything. <laughs> if I see you as a man that I'm dating, I'm not going to tell you anything, everything, okay. right? Because a lot of people when they're dating or when they're forming a relationship, they, they just hold back anything they think the other person won't like. Yeah, for sure. And they just try to share what they think the other person is going to like. Okay. And, you know, this always leads to insecurity because we don't know if that person likes us for who we are or because of the image that we're showing them. And uh, this particular client said something to the therapist one day yeah. and the therapist said, now what you just told me, I want you to go say that to Andrew at your next meeting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And she at first said, <laughs> Oh, I could never do that. Yeah. But whenever she realized not only that she could do that, but that it's important in intimate relationships, that was a life changing moment. <laughs> Ultimately, I believe that, 
this whole process, a really important part of it is an opportunity to be vulnerable and to see the results. Hmm. And we've had times in the past where we've been vulnerable and got hurt. And this is basically a time to be vulnerable and not get hurt because she's pretty much guaranteed that she's not going to be judged or criticized or abandoned yeah. by the surrogate. Yeah. And yeah. everything that we do, all these exercises as we get more and more intimate are just opportunities to be vulnerable. Okay. And then ultimately we get to, right, it's one thing to have an experience of being vulnerable, but uh -huh. it's another thing to see how that impacts the relationship. I will ask her, so after that exercise we just did, do you feel closer to me now than you did before? Mm -hmm. Do you feel more distant? Yeah. And this is to go beyond just having an experience, but to see how her actions affect the intimacy that we're forming. Okay. Wow. To see how my actions affect yeah. the intimacy that we're forming. Yeah. Uh, uh do women ever begin going on other dates with with men romantically and then have they brought that back to you and have you gotten to get in into the conversations where they're uncomfortable that they're now dating more than one person and has that ever led you to say well i feel a little jealous but that's okay <laughs> have you ever gone into that? I mean, you'd have to almost exaggerate. I suspect you probably don't feel that jealous, but has it gone there to where you were in that kind of a real scenario where a woman can really express that she's dating multiple men and, and how to talk about that honestly? Has yes. That ha that's happened. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm thinking in particular as one client I had last summer who Whenever she came to see me, she had never been on a second date ever. Okay. Right? She was in her early 40s and had never been on a second date. <sighs> let, me and, just, I, let me just digest that for a moment. <sighs> okay. That's painful. Mm. That's painful. And you helped her, didn't you? Okay. So tell me. Well, so because... Wow. So then during the time that we spent together... Yeah. We, we do all these exercises where we consciously build intimacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to, the reason I'm saying it that way is because it's not just about someone having an experience. Uh -huh. It's about consciously building intimacy and being aware of the actions that we take that consciously build intimacy. Okay. Because those are the skills that are generalizable. Okay. And this showed up with this client because um, she was still registered on a dating app during the course of our work together. Mm -hmm. And a guy reached out to her. And as we were working together, she went on three dates with this guy. Great. First time ever she's had a second date. Right. So <laughs> I said, now when you came to see me, you had only ever had, you had never had a second date. Wow. And now you've had three. What's different? <laughs> That's great. That's incredible. Yeah. And she started to see how in her past, there have been guys who are interested in her, but she w wouldn't ever see it. Okay. Or she was so afraid of being abandoned that she would abandon them first yeah. so that they didn't get the chance to abandon her. Wow. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is information and awareness that's generalizable yeah right also we want to start to have a different relationship with rejection oh, okay right if we're terrified of rejection then i won't take the risk you know to reach out and be vulnerable okay right but if we start to see that rejection can be a blessing okay right and it doesn't mean that i'm not lovable if this person doesn't want to be with me, mm -hmm. then, and I know that I'm, I'm solid enough in my sense of self, then I can take the risk to reach out and be vulnerable, mm -hmm. even if the other person won't meet me there. 
or even if the person, other person isn't interested. Because ultimately we need to develop some kind of resiliency to be able to get through experiences of relating and relationship and dating. Because as you know, they don't all end in yeah. long-term relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Um, <clears throat> where, do you, where do you struggle? Do you? Is it just pure joy and bliss that you're helping somebody? Or uh, do you uh, get a little bit nervous that the relationship starts coming to a close? Is that tough on you? It it is yeah it yeah. can be um and this comes back to the topic of attachment yeah that you brought up a while ago yeah and um so i'm first going to talk about attachment on the behalf of the client mm -hmm. and then i'll get to attachment on the behalf of of myself yeah um because a lot of therapists are concerned about that yeah. you know, they say well what happens if the client falls in love with you and so for a client though, who hasn't had the type of connections that they've wanted to have in their life, to be safe and, and secure enough to be able to form an attachment can really be a valuable step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but then some people say, well, if there's an attachment formed and the relationship is temporary, might that then be painful whenever that relationship ends? Yeah, breaking the exact thing it was meant to heal. Ca causing further harm for the thing it was meant to heal in the first place. Well, um, that's the remember, theory, but I don't, I don't think that's happening here a lot, but, or, or right. at all, actually. Go ahead, go ahead. So um, yeah. I think of the ending of the relationship as an important part of the work. Yeah. Because we want the client to see that relationships can be ended with respect and gratitude. And that I can take the better person that I've become and move forward more able to form those future relationships mm -hmm. rather than less able to form those yeah. future relationships. Yeah. And I tell my clients, my main commitment is to your future relationships. <laughs> right. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay. And yeah. so, um, yeah. the, we want the client then to know that there may be feelings at the end of a relationship, uh -huh. um, especially if there's an attachment, uh -huh. but that those feelings can be survived. And mm -hmm. then, because some clients are so afraid of the end of a relationship that they won't even take the risk to begin the relationship in the first place. Yeah. Sure. Right? And yet, if, if I have experience with starting a relationship, building a relationship, and then moving toward closure, uh -huh then that gives me confidence with every phase of the life cycle okay. of relationship. Okay, okay. And there are times whenever there's some sadness, but I have the support of the therapist that's yeah. helping with that. Um, I sometimes remind the client that what we're doing is temporary and it's to help you achieve these skills. It's for specific therapeutic goals. Mm -hmm. And I want you to outgrow me. <laughs> yeah. And eventually we'll get to a point where you outgrow your relationship with me. Yeah. And we both want that to happen. Right. Wow. Okay. Because in some ways there are limitations to our relationship. You know, it's very much once a week for two hours. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's overseen by a therapist and eventually they're going to be confident enough and have the skills enough that they're willing to reach out and take the risk on their own, having established enough resiliency that they can fall down or get rejected if it happens and still know that they're okay and still know that they're lovable yeah. as they move ahead. You know, there's such a purity in what you're describing that I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not a prude, but you know, at all, but I, I'm very surprised to hear something this controlled and this sensitive and this pure can move to sexuality. It's, it's just, it's a little, it's a little surprising to hear that that could be going on. Cause, cause 
man, you, you're playing with fire. You play with sexuality. I, I don't care how much your eye contact and your conversations are just really clear and understandable. Um, it's, it's, it's surprising to me that that step is taken. And it sounds like it's taken in very few cases, right? It's so an activity is included in the therapy under two conditions. Yeah. The first condition is that it's necessary for the client to reach their goals. <laughs> okay. As established at the beginning. Yeah. Um, by the three of us. Yeah. The second condition is that the container that we've created in terms of the relationship between us would allow that activity to be corrective rather than a repetition of patterns that already aren't working. Man, I don't even know any couple who could possibly <laughs> be clear enough that that's what they're about to do. But I get, I get what, <laughs> I get what you're saying to, to be that clear emotionally that an activity of sexuality could be used to uh, be in line with the goals and that the relationship is safe enough to then go there. Um, you know, it's kind of the, it's kind of what I would wish we, we could all learn to decide for ourselves. Mm. Um, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. That, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing that you, uh, you can get that clear uh, before you, it sounds like you do. Well, it takes several months. Yeah, I bet. You know, it's, it's never a matter of throwing someone in bed with a sex partner. Yeah. Because that's not going to be corrective. Yeah. In fact, that can do a lot of damage. Oh, yeah. Uh, instead, it's probably going to wow. be several months if we get to that point at all. Mm -hmm. And it's several months of meeting with me and developing these skills, as well as meeting with the therapist. And so we've got someone working experientially um, slowly and gradually developing more and more intimacy, developing more and more communication skills. And then we've also got the support of the therapist that's helping them address any cognitive and emotional issues. So it's really, we're coming at it from two directions. Yeah. And we do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, like I was telling you about this communication exercise Client, a client might notice in doing this communication exercise that she's uncomfortable saying no to a simple request. Yeah. If I say, may I run my fingers through your hair? Uh -huh, uh -huh. And she's uncomfortable saying no. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you she's going to be uncomfortable in a situation where both people are vulnerably and emotionally and physically naked. Yeah. And so that's what we develop. And we strengthen that muscle with the most um, innocuous requests. Okay. And we, we develop, you know, starting with basic nurturing touch and simple communication exercises, we start from the ground up. And we really practice them as much as necessary mm -hmm. until the client is confident what she wants and is really clear about her boundaries. Okay. And I won't move into any kind of sensuality or sexuality until we are both confident that that's been established. What kind of therapist, uh, whether it's a degree or training, can then bring on people that do what you do? That can bring on surrogates. What 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 kind of therapist can do that? I've worked with uh, MFTs. Any uh, MFT can decide to go down this path. Um, as far as I know, yes. Okay. Yeah, I've worked with licensed. Uh, I've worked with clinical sexologists. I've worked with licensed clinical social workers. Okay. Um, I've worked with. I think that's that's the the range. Um, MFTs, um, psychologists, probably, I'm sure. PhDs, yeah, psychologists, yeah. psychiatrists, um, yeah. clinical sexologists. Clinical sexologists. Is yeah. that what, is that a, is that a, a master's? Is that a PhD? Is there, is that what kind of license is that? Is it? it could be either. Yeah. Could be a PhD or okay. could be a master's. Um, what training, I remember you gave me a CD. Right, remember eons ago explaining this. What what 
is the training that you go through? Uh, where is it? How do you find it? What's the website? What's it called? And how long is it? What does it take to become what you're doing? I did a training with an organization called IPSA, the International Professional Surrogates Association. I, IPSA.com? Um, IPSA.us. .us, okay. IPSA.us, okay. Or surrogatetherapy.org. Surrogatetherapy.org, okay. Yeah, and their training consists of two parts. The first part is a 12-day class, um, all day, every day, plus lots of homework and uh, uh, journaling in the evening. Okay. And during that class, it's both um, didactic and uh, lectures and information, okay. but it's also experiential because you're paired up with another person in the class who becomes your training partner and you do all of the exercises that you might do in a typical course of therapy with your training partner. Okay. And you build the relationship with them. Nice. And you see the community dynamics that's happening in your group. Okay. Okay. Then the second phase of the training is a supervised internship where you see clients under the supervision of a more experienced surrogate who mentors you. Okay. And it took me about two years to complete my, um, my internship. Okay. And in that time I had been mentored by two different, uh, surrogates. But you were involved with real clients during, yes. During, you know, during the internship. You see real clients during the internship. Um, but I think it's actually great for the clients to work with, um, an intern, because not only are they getting um, the intern, they're also getting the experience of their mentor. Yeah. And the, the surrogate, the intern is also checking in with the therapist between every case as well. So they are very well supported. Yeah. And, um, and so we do that in order to give them experience and still s supervision and mentorship at the same time. Okay. And I'm at the place now that I've been um, certified for a number of years that I'm mentoring other surrogates in the internship um, phase of their training. Nice, nice. Is this an international organization, IPSA? Yes, it is. Okay, so if, I, so, so if I'm to look that up and I'm to go down that path, I really need to determine what city I'm in and if there are therapists doing this in that city. That's a big part, right? Well. A big part of the work is to educate therapists in your area. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the big drawbacks of surrogate partner therapy is there aren't a lot of people who know about it. Yeah. And the people who know about it tend to have misconceptions yeah. about the work. And so that's why I'm really a stickler on um, proper tech terminology okay. because I think some of the um, old ideas create wrong impressions. Okay. Um, so a big part of becoming a surrogate is to reach out to the therapists in your area to educate them and to form alliances with those who are in alignment with the work. And um, we have a number of resources that we can um, give to people to help them understand what it is. Like in, in uh, November, or maybe it was October of last fall, there was a TV show that featured um, an interview with a surrogate who's in San Francisco. Okay. Um, there, on CNN, there's a show called This Is Life with Lisa Ling. Okay. And the season premiere for season four was called Sexual Healing. Uh -huh. And part of that episode was an interview with Emiko Yoshikami, who lives mm -hmm. in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and it showed her working with two of her clients. Mm -hmm. And it had interviews with the therapist, with uh, the surrogate, as well as with the clients. Mm -hmm. And the clients are very well spoken about why they went into the work and what they needed from it and what they benefited from it. So we have more and more resources now to you know, give people to educate them about the work and what it's really about, as opposed to um, the misconce misconceptions that, that people sometimes have. Okay. 
I have a couple questions coming in here. Um, one of them is, can people just uh, uh, directly, uh, separate from being a surrogate, can people just direct, let's see, can people just directly hire you to coach them, uh, uh, to be a coach for them uh, and, and without the other therapist involved, just to do talk because of how knowledgeable you are about all these things? Um, Would you even want to? Well, I haven't, Okay. but possibly I could. There are different boundaries around that relationship though. Okay. And so, and I, I am willing to be in a coaching environment. It, it wouldn't be the same kind of relationship building. Yeah, for sure. It is involved with surrogate partner therapy because I'm not willing to do that. Yeah. It wouldn't be ethical to do that without the involvement of the therapist. Yeah. Can, uh, another question here. Uh, can somebody bring their own therapist to the table and, and then bring you in, or do they have to start over with a brand new therapist uh, establishing a whole new relationship? If they already have an established relationship with their MFT or psychologist or therapist, can they bring you in? I guess that would be up to the therapist to really want to be get involved with, you know, so quickly with such a different kind of relationship. Yes. So the, it is advantageous if the therapist is willing yeah. to use the therapist that they've been working with and to benefit from that already established relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. so that's preferable. Yeah. There have been cases though where the therapist wasn't comfortable with that. Yeah. So in that case then I refer them to a therapist who is experienced and comfortable with that. IPSA has um, therapists who are willing to mentor and be support for therapists who aren't experienced in the modality. Okay. Oh, and but I want to come back to uh, attachment. Okay. We talked okay. about attachment from the perspective of the client. Oh yeah. Okay. I want to talk about attachment from the perspective of the of the you. surrogate. <laughs> okay. Of of me because I also get uh, attached mm -hmm. to the clients, mm -hmm. but it's. An attachment, like I'm really aware of what that means, right? Mm -hmm. um, some people think that, oh, I love you. That means that we have to be together and you can't ever leave me or I'll be devastated. Uh -huh. And whereas um, I get quite attached to my clients, mm -hmm. but I think of it kind of like, imagine parents watching their child go off to college. <laughs> yeah. You know, sad that they're no longer in your life on the day-to-day -day basis the way they were before. Mm -hmm. But if you care about someone, you want them to be all they can be. Yeah. And you want them to go out and, um, and be all they can in the world. Mm -hmm. And you'd only be limiting them to keep them at home, to keep them under your wing. And even though I have some sadness, I'm still happy to see someone moving on and, and outgrowing their relationship with me. Yeah. And well, you're describing mental health. You're, 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 you're versed in the loss of this experience and you're, you're growing stronger. That's a real mm -hmm. loss you go through. And that is the kind of the pinnacle of mental health, uh, mm -hmm. the ability to move through loss and you're able to do it. And that basically is, my yeah. lot is to get as close to people as I can and then let them go. Yeah. No. And, <laughs> and sometimes it's sad and sometimes I have tears yeah. at the end of that relationship, yeah. but I'm really committed to what I'm doing. Yeah. And I'm yeah. really committed to that process. Yeah. Um, and I also have a very fulfilling social and, um, the yeah. sexual and romantic life myself, yeah. which is very important because I need to know that I'm not relying on the relationship with my client in order to get my own personal needs met. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I have to be able to be fully available yeah. there as of service and not have hidden agendas Yeah. because hidden agendas are probably the most, um, most likely to interfere with the, the goals of the therapy. You know, you have a, you have something to do that's even, I mean, it's, I gotta say it's even more, it's more sensitive than what I do. You know, when I work with couples in here and, or individuals, you, you know, I'm in continuous 
uh, seeking of if my agenda gets in the way and, you know, transference issues, but boy, you, you have to take it to the next level. I mean, you, you know, you know, I don't have a hint of moving into an inappropriate relationship and you are uh, uh, put on the edge of that continuously. Mm -hmm. um, that is, that is pretty fascinating. Yeah, I think of it that I have to be wow. on the dance floor participating in the dance, <laughs> yet at the uh, in the balcony watching the dance at the same time. Yeah, and the <laughs> therapist is important not only to support the client, yeah. but also to support me. Yeah, and and sometimes I'll I'll say you know gosh I'm really feeling feelings of tremendous affection for yeah. the client and, you know, or, you know, I've, I'm st I was starting to feel triggered in our last meeting yeah. and, you know, because I'm human yeah. and I, I get triggered and I have issues too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I need, I have a bunch of resources that I rely on yeah. so that I don't allow that to interfere with, the therapy that's happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Uh, uh, do 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 women uh, th throughout the whole thing and even after keep this as a very big secret that they did this? Do they? Is is that why a part of why I mean, they're not referring their friends or are they? This is not getting lots of referrals. Do they keep it to themselves that they did this? It varies from one stream, okay. extreme to the other. Okay. I would say about mm -hmm. half the clients I've seen didn't tell anyone. You know, wow. didn't tell their girlfriends, didn't tell family, didn't didn't wow. tell anyone. Yeah, yeah. I've had other people who would tell lots of people. Yeah. In their life, um, who would tell even tell their family. Wow. And I've had other people who were kind of in the middle who would tell like specific intimate girlfriends but then not tell others. Okay. Do you, do you get to uh, hear from them later? Like people, people don't call their therapists. Uh, uh, like, like, like couples don't call me, you know, a year later and say, you know, we're doing great. Thank you. I mean, sometimes they, right. So do, do you get the benefit of uh, having, finding out that they, they've, they've found relationships? Do they call you? Do they tell you? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> okay. and, yeah, I had one client who um, I got a text from her last summer where she said that she's been in a relationship for a year and a half. Great. That our work together really made that possible because yeah. of all the negotiation and, yeah. um, okay. and all of the, she became really aware of her interpretations, mm -hmm. right? I think that's um, a big issue in relationship is sometimes I'll obs there's a difference between observation and interpretation, mm -hmm. right? If I look at you and see your eyes are red, mm -hmm. I might assume you're angry at me. Okay. And then I'll respond to you as if you're angry with me. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we do that interpretation so quickly, we don't even realize we're doing it. Yeah. And if I see that happening with a client, so first what I do is I model, I might say something like, I notice that your eyes are red right now, and I assume that that means you're angry. Is that true? Okay. And so she gets a way to, to see um, assumptions being checked out. Great. Um, but you were asking about clients getting back to me. Yeah. Just yesterday, <laughs> yeah. I received this from a client, and I don't know if you can see yeah. it. But she said that she created a piece of art oh. um, that commemorated our work together. Oh, wow. And, um, and so I haven't even unwrapped it. Wow. I love it. I'd, I'd love to read it if you want to shoot me, take a picture. Not right now, maybe, but maybe just take a snapshot of it and I'll okay. include it along with the video. Yeah. Um, the uh, the yeah. heading of it is transformation. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Take a shot and snap that, send it over. So okay. I'll, I'll ask a question I asked in the beginning. I'll make this kind of last question. Um, what, what does a woman do to determine that she's in need of this service? How, how 
uh, or do you come at it from, do you come at that question from the perspective of any woman who is struggling with getting this thing right, really learning how to have intimate romantic relationship could probably learn something here. She, she, does she not need to figure out if she's hurting enough to do this? Because m- most clients come to therapy when they are just hurting. You know, couple couples don't show up at my doorstep and say, hey, we thought we'd improve our relationship today. You know, they come when they're about to get divorced, right? Right. So, so, so could most women that have had a series of failed relationships benefit from this? Um, yeah, m- many could. I would say the situation that's ideal for surrogate partner therapy is this catch-22 that sometimes people get into where the issue itself could be healed in the context of relationship. Okay. And yet the issue prevents them finding a supportive partner, Hmm. right? So it's kind of like this catch-22 of, I'm, maybe I'm too terrified to, to reach out and try to find a supportive partner. Okay. And so therefore, I'm never going to be able to build the confidence that I need to do that. <laughs> and well, so, I asked the question. Good. Yeah. yeah appreciate so that. So some, some clients can benefit. I mean, a lot of people heal this from their own life experiences. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they go on dates and they make mistakes and they learn and they they find some way to get through Mm -hmm. other people get the help of someone like yourself or a coach or, or a therapist. Yeah. And, and they get help that way. But in the situation where nothing else has helped and, um, the really, the issue itself is daunting in terms of it makes it too big of a risk in a real world environment Mm -hmm. to go out and try to make these connections. Yeah. So then what we do is we, we form, you know, a really safe and supportive relationship, Mm -hmm. um, kind of a relationship with training wheels Mm -hmm. to allow (laughs) those foundational skills to be built. Yeah. You know, this happens often. Like I had one client who uh, came from Canada last summer, Mm -hmm. Amy, and just had a horrific um, history of sexual abuse. Uh, I just tear up kind of uh, thinking about it yeah. um, at the hands of her father. Now, you can imagine that when the person who's most charged in life with taking care of you and keeping you safe yeah. is violating you, how that would impact your sense of safety in the world. And so consequently, this was a woman in her late 40s who had never kissed anyone or never held hands or, um, you know, never been in any kind of a relationship Yeah, and was, um, hyper vigilant, right. That even when people were interested in her, she would be like a skittish cat and run away and not give them an opportunity, which is completely understandable based on, um, life experiences. Okay. Um, so, wow, that's, yeah. that's a great, and you, and you, uh, you took her on and worked with her. Yeah. There's two formats for people who are local. We do the ongoing format where the client meets with the surrogate once a week and the therapist once a week Okay. for someone who's, uh, doesn't have any surrogates near them geographically. Sometimes they'll come in from out of town or the surrogate will travel to see them. Wow. In that case, we do the intensive format where they meet with the surrogate three hours a day and they meet with the therapist one hour a day. Wow. And I've done intensives anywhere from eight days up to 14 days. Wow, 14 days, three hours a day. Yeah. That's the longest date ever. It's and, uh, <laughs> and, 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 for, and an extra 14 hours of, uh, with the therapist, wow. And, and, and that has proven effective long-term for people? Uh, yeah, there's have been. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So how, so how do people find you and can they do a phone call with you? And what, what's the best website to first locate you? 
Okay, my website is surrogatepartner.us. Okay. And it has my contact information there. Okay. And people can contact me by email or or phone. I'm willing to um, talk with people to see if this might be an appropriate modality okay. for them. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. And then I'm also willing to refer them. If people contact me directly, then I refer them to a therapist. Okay. And then other times I get referrals from therapists who have clients who refer them to me. Okay. But there's always the three of us involved. And incidentally, that's actually one of the drawbacks of surrogate partner therapy, mm -hmm. because you might imagine that to see two professionals for ongoing therapy, uh, it can be fairly expensive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, uh, and that's what we want to do though. We want to educate people and uh, hopefully some people will watch this, uh, this video and uh, get educated and uh, give you a call. Uh, and, and I suspect people that have made it all the way through the video um, might have some interest in doing that. So I will. Put so that's up your, right. I'll put your website up. What are you going to say? Okay. So I was going to say, you know, yeah. because it is an investment. Yeah. So Typically, the people who come to me uh -huh. are so committed uh -huh. that they're willing to make that investment. Sure. And if they, most of them have tried like many other things along the way and have been in verbal therapy for, for decades. Right. And, um, and this is really, sometimes it's the last you know, station on yeah. the train. It's, it's a kind of a last resource. And therefore, it's really important that this work be available to people who do need it. Yeah. Oftentimes, they've tried lots of other things and haven't really gotten the results that they've wanted. Mm -hmm. um, whereas this is this unique combination. It's the only modality I know of where a trained professional is actually forming a, a relationship directly with the client to create that real life environment for building skills. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. 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 That's amazing stuff. All right. Well, I appreciate you coming on and telling us all about it. And uh, I'm going to put the uh, video up and I'll put your links. I want that picture. I want, right. I want, I want it so I can read what's, I'm curious what, what's been written on that picture. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll put your website and uh, people will uh, find their way to you and contact you. Well, thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah, it's been really fun, Andrew. All right. I'll see you in person soon, hopefully. It's some, some gathering. Okay. All right, Andrew. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.